know how God works in very mysterious ways. Two or three other people then mentioned healthcare administration to me. So finally I said, okay, you know, I have to start doing research on this. So I did, and then I entered my master's in healthcare administration at the University of Missouri in Columbia. Okay, did you all hear the, the journey? And just when you think you're supposed to be doing something and God has another plan for you? Yeah. Um, how many STEM supporters do we have in this space by show of hands, STEM, STEM? All right, so I'm just going to do a shameless plug. I wasn't the best student in STEM, but look who was. <laughs> Chemistry is Janelle's background, and so for now I have a better understanding of <laughs> your process of thinking, for how you ask us to do certain things, and then understanding your path that you want to be a physician. Did Dr. Cosby know you wanted to be a physician? I don't know. Okay, I'm just going to see that. That was a sidebar. I'm sorry. I forgot you all the way out there. I'm just, I'm just curious. <laughs> okay, so when you think of your applying for your first two jobs as an administrator, if you will, in healthcare, yeah. uh, some women in the audience here, uh, I know I'm one, we, we struggle with negotiating our salaries to give our work. A am I the only one that I just include you all? <laughs> am I the Anybody struggle with? Oh, are your bosses here? <laughs> Don't tell them, tell them to close their eyes. You struggle, you struggle with salary negotiations. Let me see your hands. Salary, yeah. This is what happens when you have bosses come and bring very, so bosses can't come next time, okay? Because they can't be honest. But my question is though, uh, and I've, I've asked you this personally, like how do you navigate the space of negotiating your salary? Well, yeah, I, I did, Nicole and I did talk about Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, which is actually still in Nazareth, Kentucky, 
they set that foundation um, for the service that we provide. And then that continues on. So the, the building then from that foundation is about finding and attracting talent that also supports that mission and that ministry. And at Memorial, we talk a lot about bringing your personal ministry to our organization and then collectively serving um, as a ministry together. So when we find that there's those commonalities in ministry and commonalities in purpose and mission, then the organization's advancement is so much easier because everyone's working um, in a collective um, approach. So that, that's really how it works and the talent then really attracts itself and has this mission for service together. So I'm gonna give you all an opportunity to help with the questions that I have for Janelle. Are you ready? So this, you have one, of this, one assignment, that is to repeat after me. So you ready for the question for Janelle? It's yes. two words. Why Chattanooga? Why Chattanooga? <laughs> Why not Chattanooga? <laughs> um, you know, I, I have, uh, in my career, I have worked in very many different parts of the country. Um, I actually was born in Minnesota, so I was born in the north. I grew up in Kentucky, which, by the way, thinks they're in the south. Don't tell Kentucky they're not. <laughs> but, um, and then I had uh, my career in the Midwest, my career in the West, and then came back to the Midwest, and uh, most recently before here, Chicago. So when I had the opportunity to come back to Chattanooga, the, when I interviewed here, I just fell in love with the people. Um, and I, I've always wondered, is it because I had that, that um, experience in my life in Kentucky and the Southern hospitality, and this just felt like coming home? Um, but the people at Memorial and their passion and their charism is strong. The people in this community are so welcoming. Um, so I fell in love, and that's really what brought me to uh, this community. And then I love it because it's the, the beauty of this community. You know, all the outdoor activities, the richness of our um, arts and uh, our culture that we have here with fantastic museums and other things we have, the affordability of living, all of those things really helped um, to bring me here. This community is, reminds me a lot of when I lived in the West. I lived in Boise, Idaho, which is actually a community that we as a chamber constantly compare ourselves to. But um, Boise had some very similarities in terms of size and some of the activities and some of the talent. So it really feels natural and it feels like home here. Um, but first and foremost, it's the people. Oh, well, you all did a good job. Give yourself a hand on the question. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. I'll be letting you help me along the way for more questions, okay? So let's switch gears because we are at a chamber function and it's all about, you know, some chamber business structure. So there are some things that we need to, I guess you could say, let the cat out the bag. So when you think of healthcare, and I see you leaning in, Lauren. Don't lean in too far, you're going to get my water. Um, when you think about chamber, you think about healthcare, you think about procurement diversity, what are some things that our health system that you can share, because you know we like to keep some secrets too, <laughs> but what are some things that you can share when you think of like supplier diversity and what we have contributed for our health system in the community? Yeah, you know, again, because our foundation is from a um, perspective of caring and service to the community, um, CHI Memorial just continues that. We do that in many, many ways. Um, most recently, we've done quite a bit around health equity and, and diversity and uh, starting to work on uh, things with the chamber actually to start focusing on how to address some uh, disparities of care. And as we started this work, um, some of the first things we did, and myself and Betsy Kamendiener, who is our VP of Mission, she's here, she can wave her hand, we sat down and we said, you know what, we have to actually, if we are going to participate in the community and play a role in the community with regards to diversity and equity, we have to be able to do the work inside our organization as well. Um, so one of the first things we did is hired Nicole. 
which was a, a brilliant move. Um, and you know, together what we're trying to do is, again, work on the diversity within our organization. We're trying to work on um, our part to play in the community. And then on health equity, what we feel like our part is, is, is to really start to address disparities. And as you all know, during the pandemic, a lot of the disparities were really highlighted. Um, and so what we've started is we said, you know, we really have to start with leadership first. So we spent all of last year really in um, deep dialogue and deep education with our board um, to start to understand, you know, some of the structural racism that exists to understand how the history of racism in our country and the challenges that we're having actually impact how we deliver care um, because that's our role. You know, our role in the community is to, is to provide medical care. Um, and so we spent a good deal of time. We actually enlisted some support from the Rhodes faculty. So Rhodes is a, the college in Memphis. Um, they have a program around health equity. And so we asked that faculty to come engage with our leadership and our board, medical leadership and board leadership and we did a lot of things. We did some cool things around a community immersion project, did a lot of education throughout the year, had a series of different education topics, and then um, had a culmination at the end of the year with our board retreat, really bringing all of those things together. Um, so we, we learned to understand how housing, um, adequate housing impacts um, health equity. We looked at um, roads and transportation and how that impacts um, equity and then how we in our health system need to work on delivering competent care, uh, culturally competent care. So, you know, a lot of things coming together and really enlightening and we're fortunate to have a board that's been extremely supportive um, of this initiative and to move us forward. So this next year, what we're working on now is really taking that education even deeper into the organization because until we kind of lift up an awareness, it's hard to really get in and then make some systemic changes. But I'm really proud because we now have an explicit strategic plan, has three major pillars. One of the first major pillars is to start looking at all of our quality data and our clinical data from a lens of diversity. So we're taking, for example, sepsis care, and sepsis is you know, a, a disease in the hospital where it's caused by a severe infection, but trying to take a look at those kinds of things, like hypertension by different diverse categories, and saying, okay, what, do we have a disparity in results um, within those categories, and then what do we do to address those results? Um, and that is an important part. And, this year, I'm really excited because we'll be likely using the Rhodes faculty again to really work with our medical staff um, and our clinicians in the hospital because, trust me, the clinicians in our hospital, they got into healthcare to, to care and provide service as well. And they believe that, yes, they are doing that the same for every single patient. But we know there's data out there that results in different health disparities. So we have to uncover that, build an awareness of that, and then systemically start to work on change. So um, that's the kind of work we're trying to do with health equity. And then, again, working in the community to address, to play a part in addressing housing and other kinds of things. But, those aren't our core competencies, we're a healthcare system. But we can support and we can participate and we can um, help to um, be active in those other pieces because housing does influence health status. Um, the poverty influences health status. You know, public safety influences health status. So we've gotta figure out how we play a part in that. Um, but first, focusing on things we can do inside our organization. So I want to recap. You said oh, poverty sorry. influences health status, uh -huh. and you said housing, housing, um, public safety. Um, those are all many social determinants of care. Betsy, what other ones did I miss? Transportation. Transportation's a big one. Food security. All yeah. those things do have an influence. So I said that because um, these are some questions that you can have uh, when we wrap up in a few uh, few minutes. Uh, I do want to share something with you when you think of 
diversity spending from our corporate. Our corporate company is called Common Spirit Health. And so I just wanted to kind of see where we were as a health system and how much we were spending for supplier diversity. So yeah. I'm going to give you some dollar amount, right? So in fiscal year 21, CHI Memorial spent just over, anybody want to guess? <laughs> oh, don't get shy on me now because you all were talking earlier. <laughs> anybody want to guess an amount? Low figure. <laughs> Can I get another figure? Three, Three what? Three million. You're close. Should I just give you the number? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Charlie's my former student, by the way. So I, I appreciate you leaning in and answering the question. So 8.3 million. Now you all can say, wow, louder than that. <laughs> 8.3 million on supplies and services with diversity owned businesses, accounting for 5.6 diversity spend as a percentage of total spend for the facility. 8.3 million. Look at Lauren. Lauren, you get it. I do. Now, why, why, why do we have the silence on the other side of the stage? Is that just a still in shock? Are we in, <laughs> are we in a moment? No, I think it's a combination of one. It's very impressive. And then again, we're working on this procurement pilot. So, of course, I was looking at uh, best practices and lessons learned. And that's how positive. So, when you walk out of this space today of 618 and you're heading back to your jobs, if you want to send a first text message, make sure that you share the data that I just shared. I see Don Ford over there going, Yes, I sure will. <laughs> so, uh, I want to transition just a little bit. Uh, when you think of community outreach, and since you discover you're more community based versus physician based, when you think of what our physicians are doing, when you think of what our clinical yeah. staff are doing, when you think of the, the staff at CHI Memorial and the community outreach, can you touch base just a little bit on not what everybody is doing, but some things that kind of catch your eye of what people are doing? Yeah, and like I said, it's, it's just a great team approach. And um, the, probably some of the things that stand out the most for me, and I'll have Betsy and you and Nicole, you guys can chime in, Rennell and others can chime in, but during the pandemic was a pretty profound moment for many, everybody in the country, many, many in healthcare. Um, because we, have, we, you know, we entered this with such uncertainty and as healthcare providers, uh, we rushed to the emergency, we rushed to the uh, challenge and to try and serve. And uh, so I was just extremely impressed every day with our clinicians who leaned in and took care of patients, knowing that they were really um, in, uh, putting themselves in harm's way um, and still caring for patients. And then um, I wish you all could have been at the hospital the day the vaccines came out and we gave vaccines to all of our workforce, it was moving. It was an emotionally moving moment because there was a sense of um, relief and hope and that this was, uh, we were gonna live through this. And so many of our clinicians um, actually went out into the community and actually even as recent as last week, were still out in the community offering vaccines. Um, just to anyone who will accept them and who will take them. And really, more importantly and powerfully, educating the public on the importance of the of vaccination and the importance of taking care of themselves. Um, so the vaccine process has been a really an amazing, um, powerful um, aspect of what we've been doing. A um, lot of things, and I'll brag on Betsy here, she's, doing, she's out in the community right now doing work with homelessness. And again, you think, well, that's not health care, but it is. It is. You know, may, again, taking care of our citizens, making sure that they have homes and adequate housing, as I said, does um, influence the, that work. Nicole is out in the community all the time, you all, talking about uh, and, and actually organizing and putting together health fairs that really are providing services, particularly to vulnerable populations or underserved populations. Um, those are critical things um, that we are doing. And then I'll let Renelle, you and Betsy and Nicole, other things that you all want to highlight. Well, in case you're wondering who she's talking about, oh, sorry. the CHI Memorial table is right there in the very back <laughs> by the door. Uh, 
Team, could you wave so people can see you? All right, okay. And uh, who would like to come forth and use a microphone to share at this time, if you would like to share, while I kind of give some updates as well. When you think of what Janelle was mentioning earlier about the vaccine fairs and what our physicians were going out to do, I want you to understand that 99% of that was volunteer hours from our physicians and our clinical staff. Right. 99%. And it wasn't just one weekend of the month. It wasn't just two weekends of the month. It was a serious, rigorous schedule that they did every month, every month. And I was so inspired by watching this. Speaking of inspiration, I want to go back because you talked about uh, the board uh, immersion retreat. Yes. So I had a chance to be there at that experience. And we split up and went to different lenses of Chattanooga. And I watched Janelle go from the north side of Chattanooga to the west side, and I watched her walk those neighborhoods to gather and understand it. The only thing I didn't do, would you like to know what I didn't do? <laughs> I didn't take a picture. Oh. I wanted people to see her compassion, mm. her leadership. She leaned right into those communities and walked and just walked and I thought, people need to see this. But Betsy is at the microphone. Uh, so, well, Mike's over here, Betsy, Betsy, the microphone's over here. I'm sorry. See, when you have these lights in this, cha this chair to do something for you. Um, <laughs> so, Betsy, would you like to share uh, what Janelle was talking about? Yeah. It's on. Yolanda says it's on. That means we probably wanted to speak up just a little bit. Yeah, so. I'll hold it. I'll put on my preacher voice. <laughs> so in the middle of the pandemic, um, we get this call from National, from our Common Spirit Health, and said, you know, Chattanooga would be a great place to start this new project of exploring the intersection of healthcare and homelessness. Yen? <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh do you not realize there's a pandemic going on? And, and we're just like this. <laughs> and, but I, I talked with Janelle and she said, yeah, I think this is something we need to do. So for, we're in the second of three years of partnering with agencies and, and that work with people experiencing homelessness to explore deeply what is the connection between healthcare and homelessness. And the first four or six months was this dialogue of, what was that you said? <laughs> what do those initials mean? How is it that you work? How is it I work? You know, that is profound. To have the luxury of time to really sit down with well-meaning providers of a completely different world from yours and say, uh, first we just need to figure out what we're talking about. And then how do we together form our own plans. And so we're working with coaches um, at the national level. Chattanooga is one of six pilot sites. We're the only one east of the California border. <laughs> the others are in Alaska, Oregon, and then California. So really proud that Chattanooga was chosen. Um, people at, at the beginning, they were going like, where's that? Huh? <laughs> um, but now they're going, what are y'all doing? We want to do it too. So very quickly, because I don't want to take time away, we're working on three initiatives. One is data sharing. Wouldn't that be amazing if somebody comes in the hospital who's already been helped by one of the homeless agencies could be identified and shared with their permission um, so that a centralized data sharing, I call that the unicorn. <laughs> um, and then another thing that has come up over and over is medical respite. When you have someone you're ready to discharge from the hospital, if they go back out to the streets, where are they going to end up? Right back, maybe not the same hospital, maybe another hospital starting all over again. So we have partnered with three agencies in Chattanooga to try to stand up medical respite beds for folks who do not need the acute level care, but do need supportive ongoing care with the goal of, if they wish, to move into supportive housing. And, and then the third is to continue this, this conversation. This three years is not enough to solve homelessness. <laughs> We thought it would be done in two. Um, but that how do we keep these relationships going? What kinds of funds and resources do we need to keep that going? Um, and it's not just Memorial. It's not, Earth Langer is very involved in this. We would love to continue to expand because no 
one agency, no one hospital can do it by themselves. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I will just do a quick recap because I'm conscious of the time. You, you should feel this energy right here uh, with Darian. He's like, uh, staff I, I got you, I got you. It's the chair, I, I'm telling I you. Have one other thing. Oh, Janelle has something else. Go ahead. Well, I think the other thing to highlight is some of the pieces we do in workforce. Um, and we're really, really proud of our Morehouse Medical School partnership. And we launched that a couple of years, well, actually maybe a year and a half ago, um, where we actually host medical students for clinical rotations here in town from Morehouse. That's now expanded to LMU as well. Um, but it's part of a larger initiative that our parent corporation, Common Spirit Health, is launching. And Common Spirit Health is raising $100 million across the country. The purpose of the partnership really is to encourage more black and Latin uh, medical students or students to enter the medical profession. That's profound and that's impressive and I'm very, very proud that we've been one of the first markets um, within Common Spirit Health to do that. And then this week, really excited because they just started their, new, their first set of students um, in Kentucky, another one of our markets. So it's expanding and it's growing. So really proud of the Morehouse work uh, that we're doing. And I got a story to tell. And by the way, because of the partnership with the Morehouse School of Medicine, we are acknowledged as uh, champions of health care in Chattanooga for diversity in medicine because Janelle says, I want those students to be at CHI Memorial in Chattanooga first. This is the type of leadership. And then I was, I don't know, maybe a month or so in the job, and Janelle says, I need you to insert yourself on the implementation team of this partnership. And I'm just looking <laughs> at the screen. What do you mean insert? What do you mean? She, oh, just insert yourself. And so that's one of the, one of the best <laughs> projects I've been able to serve on because you know this is the type of leader that we have. Insert yourself. I just go up and say, hey, I'm here. But she, just insert yourself. So use that word if you want to work on a project. <laughs> it will be very rewarding, even like winning an award. Uh, I, I want to switch to a fun round in just a moment. So I do want to say, when you think of our impact, so for we've done things with Juneteenth, we've done things uh, with the Hunter Museum of American Art. They mm. have the Black Professional at the Hunter. We're over there doing partnerships with them. And so I wanted to let you know, if you haven't heard or realized it, uh, Janelle is the new board chair for the Tennessee Hospital Association. Oh, and of course, she's the new board chair for the Chamber of Commerce in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So I'm looking at the clock. Can we have some fun really quick? Absolutely. Okay, but don't give me a pink slip. No, <laughs> never, never. It's part of the job. We're going to have some fun. Yes. And then I'll let you have some questions. So if you think about your, get ready to ask your questions. We will do one, two, three, four, five. Quick fun things with Janelle and then get ready for your questions. Janelle, are you ready to have some fun with Nicole Brown at this time? Yes, yes. Your challenge, your assignment, yeah. you have to answer this in one word. Oh, one word? Oh, dear. Yeah, but okay. see, if you were not my smart friend, I would do this question. <laughs> All right, one word to describe your leadership during COVID. Collaborative. See how quick that was? You heard it nice. All right, one word to describe women and leadership and why women need to lean in. Potential. Did, did you hear the amen corner over here? Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. This is the easy one. I know you like to eat. I've seen you eat. <laughs> but what is your one favorite food? Uh, food that someone else is cooking. That's more than one word. <laughs> Right now we said one. She, see, I tried it. But she does bring good food, I'm telling you. Okay. <laughs> Fitness. Um, what's your favorite? Do you dance? Do you walk? Do you jog? Like, what's your one go-to for fitness? Um, yoga. Somebody gave me a nudge on the tip, too, so I have one other thing for speed round. Ladies, would you like to help me with this one? She, one word, ask her about work-life balance. <laughs> Ready, go. Work-life work, balance. balance. Ooh. <laughs> um, st 
still practicing. <laughs> Getting there. <laughs> Love that one. Okay, and then somebody said, you know Janelle is an avid reader. Favorite book? Ooh. Well, I can just, my favorite that I'm reading right now, rereading, are the Inspector Gamache books. Do you guys read Inspector Gamache? <laughs> See, if you read them, you love them. I'm starting at the beginning again, so I'm halfway through still, still life again. So I just, they're detective series. They're set in Canada in this fictional town called Three Pines, and I'm very much in love with Inspector Gamache, but my husband thinks it's okay because he's fake. <laughs> love, love, love that. Um, at this time, we're going to take your Q&A. We have a microphone right here down front, so please make your way to the front here. The microphone is right here. So if you have a question, please come forward. Please come forward. Don't be shy. Oh, I see somebody scooting out of one of the, okay. one of the tables. And we do appreciate you for your questions. And so if anybody else have a question, please get behind her. And we will uh, spend a few moments with asking questions with Janelle Riley. Ooh, cute skirt. She says cute skirt, by the way. <laughs> it is really not a question. But I have to brag on you all. Can I do that? Sure. Really Absolutely. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> So for those who don't know me, and I'm looking directly at you, Janelle, because I do know a lot of people shaking a little bit. You all took very care, very good care of my husband during COVID. Mm. Oh. And um, at that point, I was an appointee by our former mayor, mm -hmm. and I worked with Dr. Kotze. We were giving vaccines. Oh. We were in the community, mm -hmm. and my husband got COVID. Ooh. Not only did he get COVID, he nearly died. Oh. And so he was with you all from December to like, March. Wow. And I see you, I see you, all of those things. And the nurses were there and I still had to do my job. I was out. Um, I was in the community. We were giving vaccines. C CHI was there. Uh, I saw the diversity. I saw the people hugging no matter what race. I, you know what I mean? It was just love. And oh, um, of course, I get to work with Lauren and all the folks at, at, at the chamber in my new um, uh, appointment now as supplier diversity for Mayor Kelly, mm. but I cannot thank you all enough no. for what I saw. I saw words and action, and I saw people in communities that were being cared for who were very scared, mm -hmm. even nurses that were out there. And somebody threw a volunteer, I had a, um, a reflective jacket threw on me, and they were like, go out here and you can, you know, direct traffic. I said, really? <laughs> For anybody who knows me, that is not my forte. <laughs> so um, I, I want to say thank you for your commitment, mm. and I want to say thank you for your partnership, but more than that, thank you for your leadership, because you all are not just talking. Mm. You all are doing the work. Mm. And anything that we can do on behalf of the mayor's office and supplier diversity, I'm both a lion and a dove. I do not play when it comes to supplier diversity. Mm. Mm. But I, um, I understand the importance of having people on the ground like Nicole, who I love, mm -hmm. um, but certainly you and your leadership. I never got to meet you, but today I had to tell you that. Oh, and I thank, thank you. you. And my husband is alive and well. Yay. We got married. Yay. <laughs> and so um, I thank you. I thank you. And I honor you today. Thank oh, you. Well, thank you. Wow. Um, is this the part that is sponsored by Kleenex? Because I probably I need know. some. <laughs> it and will be my honor to tell the clinical team your thanks. You tell Dr. Dr. Kodzi. Dr. Kodzi, Dr. Kodzi. I will Kodzi. tell him. Yes, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So I'm a former CHI nurse. Yay! And I loved working at CHI because you could share your faith. Yes. And it was, it was spectacular, the support you got. I love the chamber because they are very supportive. I went through Leadership Chattanooga. Yay. What an amazing, amazing program. Mm -hmm. But my question is, for everyone here, we all want to get involved. How do we get involved in, a, in the best way? Well, I wish Jean Payne was here because there are so, Jean Payne, if you all don't know her, is our Director of Volunteer Services. So at the hospital, the way to get involved would be through volunteering. And, 
I've said this uh, many, many times. I've worked in different hospitals across the country. The volunteers at CHI Memorial, I think they're our secret sauce, and the caliber of volunteers is just phenomenal. You know, uh, captains of industry, you know, to um, housewives, to teachers, to retired, you name it, the profession um, is represented by our volunteers. And they too have had that compassionate uh, service. So volunteers, we, we take all ages um, of volunteers would be one way at CHI Memorial. I think the other thing in terms of getting involved, um, and I know Christy could talk about this with the chamber, is getting involved in a lot of the strategic planning. Christy and her team did a fabulous job as they were launching the new Velocity 2040 involving, what was it, Christy, 5,000 members of the community. So stay in, included, stay, in, stay engaged in that. It makes a difference to have all the voices in terms of setting the direction. So as a community, those are very much opportunities um, along those lines. And then being involved with your associations, being involved with your organizations, helping to lead the charge around diversity and equity and around growth and, and around the care and the growth of this community and the vitality and vibrancy of this organization. Just by being engaged in what you're doing now is, is powerful, makes a difference as well. So, good question. I want to brag on Janelle, too. Uh-oh. She says, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Renelle, you got my back in case something happened, right? Okay, got you. <laughs> Renelle is our market director for communication. When I did a program, uh, I was, what, one month in the job, and I said, I want to do a minorities in health care panel. And I had these two young men who are natives of Chattanooga mm -hmm. doing their residency. Um, Janelle saw the flyer, saw the program, and she struts in the office, hey, what are they doing? Do they want to come back home? What's the specialty? So that was February of last year. In medicine terms, it takes the time to do certain things, I'll say that. But can I let you know that September 1st, mm -hmm. Janelle hired the Dr. Hockstrom twins, who are <laughs> natives of Chattanooga, graduates of the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, Janelle saw them that one time and was on it, you understand, <laughs> on it, and made it happen and hired not one black male physician, two black male physicians that understand this community. And it was very competitive because they could have gone to any other city with three million followers on social media. Wow. Leadership, yeah. that's what that is. And you, you have to understand, uh, Janelle is very, you know, no. <laughs> she went, I want them, and she got them. So I want to make sure I brag about her on well, that. Do we have any more questions? Uh oh, Yolanda's coming to the hey, microphone. If, if, the, if the twins were here, they would be giving out their practice address. So they would be. <laughs> I'll do it for them. They're on Hickson Pike, that CHI memorial site on Hickson Pike, and they're taking new patients. So. Yeah. Yeah. She said, I saw that. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, what is the biggest lesson that you have learned during your tenure as CEO of CHI Memorial? Um, my biggest lesson, um, well, I'll tell you the lesson that I keep working on every day, and that is to um, let the team do their work. Um, are many of you practi practitioners of the lean process improvement philosophy and really making sure that you let your subject matter experts lead in the right situations. Um, that's so important and I think that really was highlighted through the pandemic um, and continues to be highlighted. It's one of the lessons we're trying to hold on to very dearly um, because when it came to the vaccines, et cetera, we let our pharmacy team lead. When it came to making decisions about universal precautions and things we should do in the hospital, we let our infectious disease leaders lead. When it came to identifying our design work for our critical care, we let the critical care physicians and critical care nurses lead. You have to let those who are subject matter experts do their thing. 
um, and just make sure that we're coordinating and not missing the um, parts and helping to fill in the gaps and making sure people are connected. Um, so that's a lesson that we're continuing to try and hang on to dearly that we learn um, during the pandemic. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh-oh, get ready for this question. <laughs> let me let me change my feet. Okay. Out. okay, so you all, I have to tell you, you know, um, Christy with the Chamber, I've had such a privilege and honor in my career of working with Janelle, and I'm not, I'm not going to get emotional her, but she is such a phenomenal leader, and I've been in awe by the way she inspires thousands uh, in her relatively short time in Chattanooga, really, um, in terms of the vastness of her career. She inspires men and women in such a unique way, and I think it's her compassion. She's pulled together. I mean, for those of you who don't know, we've worked in the healthcare sector quite a bit as a chamber, um, and it's a very um, competitive environment, right? I mean, I like to say coopetition a lot, but Janelle kind of can, she, I know, isn't that a great coopetition? She just kind of can cut through that and bring people together in such a unique way. Um, but my question is, I feel like you're pulled in so many direct directions here. You're chair of our board, chair of the hospital association board for the state, you know, you're, you are constantly tapped for leadership. How do you kind of, we, you know, Nicole asked the question about balance, um, but how do you forgive yourself when you feel like, oh, I should be doing this, or gosh, I didn't do this? Mm. Like, like, how do you internally, you know, manage all of that and, and keep driving forward, right? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I guess, uh, and what I told Betsy on the way over is, I'm not sure why anyone wants to hear my life. It's pretty boring. <laughs> so I'm just grateful you guys showed up and listened today. Um, but, you know, I guess for me, you have to have that humility. You have to know you're human, right? And we're all tapped in multiple ways, particularly as women in professions. You know, we have our families, we have our friends, we have our business that we have to run and lead. And we have to lean on each other and help and support each other. And then, yeah, just what you said, Chris, you have to forgive yourself and you have to say, I can't do it all. Um, what I tend to like to do as I look at my staff is see who else would be really good at that. <laughs> Fortunately, there is a talent uh, pool that is abundant um, at CHI Memorial. And so then, you know, and I think it's also a way to lift others up and challenge others uh, to lean in. And one of the things Nicole and I talked about recently is, you know, at, throughout my entire career, you know, and I think it's true for women, women never think that they're ready for the next job or they're ready for the next piece or ready to do whatever challenge is put before them. Um, and I have to say, you just have to lean in. You know, we all feel like maybe we're imposters a little bit in our roles, but you have to lean in. And once, I don't, really what I've learned is not, you're really not expected to know everything. <laughs> You're expected to be able to find the solutions. You're expected to figure out how to network and find the right people that can help do the work.
um, at heart and is going to see things in you that you may not see in yourself and give you opportunities. Um, so I, I continue to say that's still an important thing. I have lots of mentors um, in my life and they're not always my bosses. And the, many of them are the, my, colleague, my colleagues that I work with day in and day out. And then I think it's, then it's very much about, um, again, going back to as women, you just have to lean in. You have to just raise your hand and you have to be there to take opportunities and take opportunities that you think, this is not where I wanna go. Um, this is not at all my path because you never know. That just building that broad base of experience and knowledge is what helps you be adaptable to many situations. And uh, so much in, uh, I think, professions and as you move up in your career, it's not being a subject matter expert in a particular area. It's being able to have a diverse background that you know you can flex and adapt to. Um, so I would say, Lean in, raise your hand, take those opportunities. You never know when it's going to be helpful. <laughs> yeah. Well, Janelle, thank you for allowing me to oh, have this conversation welcome. with you. you. Please give her a hand. Yeah.